Hello everyone. What you're about to see is a recorded interview that I had with Professor Ronald Hutton, University of Bristol this afternoon, uh, about Celtic mythology and Celtic legends and just about the Celts in general. Um, all these questions were gathered from people in my seminars and my writing groups. And even though we didn't get to all of them, Professor Hutton was very generous with his time. So I hope you enjoy the answers. We have a very, very special treat today, a very special guest, the legendary, legendary Professor Ronald Hutton. You'll be a myth soon, but a legendary for now. Uh, legendary Professor Ronald Hutton, author of Queens of the Wild, which of course I have right here. Um, Stations of the Sun, which is my Bible, which I actually have open in the background on the digital, <laughs> digital version. Uh, the Witch, which I also have right here, which I have to keep lending out because people keep asking me for it. Uh, Blood and Mistletoe, Triumph of the Moon, The Druids, Rise and Fall of Mary England is Professor of History at University of Bristol uh, and a leading authority on ancient medieval and modern paganism, the history of the British Isles in the 16th and 17th centuries, and the global context of witchcraft beliefs. Professor, welcome and thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> I, I really can't believe you said yes, just on a whim like that. It, usually when I ask, you know, you always get air or or it's, oh, you know, I'm busy or I can't in this moment. And I know you're very busy, so we'll we'll get to the questions. So uh, all the oh. questions are exactly uh, as people have written them. Some of them left names, so I'll, I'll read out the names. Uh, but uh, all of these people are very aware of what you do and who you are. So... Uh, question number one, what did the Celts call themselves? They had different cultures, different gods, different clans and kings. The Romans called them Celts when referring to Gaul, but what did they call each other? The answer is, as far as we can tell, they used the names of their separate tribes. Okay. There's not much sign that they felt that they were a common people in the later nationalistic sense. They certainly weren't part of a common confederacy or common state. They certainly felt related to other tribes in their regions by language, but that didn't stop them fighting them. <laughs> like most peoples, they banded together pretty efficiently when there was a big threat from the outside, like the Romans. Um, I remember reading, I can't remember where it was, maybe Pictish Chronicle, that uh, the Irish called the Picts the Cruini, and then... Uh, but they called themselves something else. So it seems like they all had, I wouldn't say code names, but they all had names for each other, depending on where they were geographically. And they seem to be fine with that. And I think, I think it's kind of strange that we all just band them together in this term Celtic. I mean, now we talk about Celtic in terms of languages, but it's quite strange that, you know, Brythonic Celts and Gaelic Celts and that everybody should be considered to be one major thing, which I, I think is quite odd. Um, this this one, admittedly, is sort of my question because when I do uh, when I do uh, uh, seminars on Celtic mythology and uh, and Irish culture, um, the these questions sort of come up. So this is one I just kind of wrote down. Knowing that the Gudenstrap cauldron has elephants on it, can we still consider it to be true Celtic art? No, <laughs> is the answer. Oh, no. uh, it's it's an astonishing blend of different styles. Uh, as you've indicated, some of the patterns pretty well clearly come from India, hence the elephants and some of the other animals. Uh, the famous uh, antler-headed cross-legged god looks remarkably like an image of Shiva from the Indus Valley. On the other hand, Shiva isn't wearing pyjamas in quite that way. And it looks as if uh, an Indian god has been blended with a European one. In terms of metalwork, we're now pretty sure the cauldron is made by the shores of Black Sea, which is an area outside even the wildest stretch of Celtic territory. So definitively, if it's made there, it's not Celtic. But there may be different influences, some of them from Celtic-speaking peoples in the mix. The one thing we can't do now is call the cauldron Celtic art or a Celtic, art, Celtic artifact, pure and simple. Going to have to change all the textbooks. You know, every every time you see the, the name of Celts, that image always shows up. I even have it on one of my slides. <laughs> 
<laughs> in which I tell people that, of course, you know, there's elephants on it. Uh, ah, I love I love shooting down the 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 preconceptions. It's great. Uh, next question. So uh, this one, this one, I actually asked you a little bit over email. So the origin of the Kranavaha, which really should be spelled differently, the Celtic tree of life. Where does this idea for a single Celtic tree presenting life come from? If the Celtic peoples were all different peoples, does it have something to do with the Inish Avlach? Does it have something to do with the Druids and their sacred oaks? I confess that I hadn't heard of this thing until very recently. And I have no idea where it comes from. It certainly doesn't come from the ancient world or medieval Welsh or Irish literature. It looks like a perfectly feasible and workable and justifiable modern extrapolation from the Kabbalah using Celtic ideas, names, and images. Are there other uh, examples of uh, mysticism from the Kabbalah to the, the Celtic world that have been sort of superimposed? I can't think of another. Uh, and there may be some import from the, the Norse Yggdrasil, but uh, the new Celtic tree of life doesn't seem to work like Yggdrasil. No, it, it doesn't. works more like the Kabbalistic tree of life. And I, as as I said to you, it seems like every jeweler from here to Balana claims either that they have their own style or that they've made it, or uh, or that it's some kind of ancient Irish thing, but it just isn't. And even though I know that, you know, obviously there's sacred oaks and apples were very, very important in the mythology. When I when I look at the Celtic tree and I think, well, there's no apples on it. There's no there's no indication that it's an oak tree. What tree is this? There, there just seems to be no answer. Yeah. Speaking of no answer, uh, the wicker man. Where did the wicker man come from? There is very little archaeological evidence for it. So what were the Romans seeing, or did they just make it up for the purposes of demonizing their enemies? They could have made it up, or it could have been a true tradition found in Gaul, present-day France. There are two authorities for it. One is Caesar, Julius Caesar, and the other is the Greek geographer called Strabo, who may actually be reporting a garbled version of what Caesar said. So there may be just one source instead of two. And Caesar said that when the tribes of Gaul hit trouble, they constructed uh, a large image and they put human sacrifices, mostly condemned criminals, into that and set it on fire. Uh, we have no idea how reliable this report is. It could be a totally objective piece of ethnographic reporting, or it could be a made-up bit of Roman propaganda. The important thing is that it's an amazingly live modern image because of a book and a film. And the book is the first illustrated history of Britain by an enterprising lawyer in the 1670s called Eilat Sams, who published the very first picture book of British history. And he included a really striking and imaginative depiction of Caesar's wicker man. And this has gone down ever since. I've got a tea towel with that same image from Sams on it. And it was seen by the screenplay writer of uh, the B-movie, The Wicker Man, came out in 1973. And it's really that film with its massive cult status on both sides of the Atlantic that has produced its modern familiarity. I remember in one of your talks, you were talking about um, uh, one of the bog bodies. I think you were talking about Lindo Man. And uh, you had said that you know, there's a great mythology around Lindo Man that he that he was killed by uh, by evil means, and then you had found that it was completely different than the original account that was given. I didn't find that it was completely different. What I found was the original diagnosis was uh, faulty. In other words, the body had been seen by two experts right at the beginning. And one had said the man had died an elaborate ritual triple death of being strangled, smashed on the head, 
and had his throat cut. And the other expert, who was equally able, said he'd been beaten to death. Uh, his skull had been broken, his neck had been broken, and a rib of his had been broken. And the cut throat and the strangulation were both mistakes on, on the part of the other medic. Uh, and so we don't really know how he died. Uh, and all we can say is he probably comes from the Roman period when they didn't have human sacrifice. Uh, he could have been a human sacrifice persisting secretly. He could have been an executed criminal. He could have been a murder victim. He's not the only body from that area, even from that particular bog. There's a Roman tradition of uh, killing people and putting them in bogs in that area of northwest England, as it now is, in Roman times. But we have three choices there, and all I urge is choice. Well, we'll get to choice when we talk about Rhiannon also. <laughs> um, Next question is uh, ooh, a spicy question, getting into the meat and potatoes of, uh, of controversy. Did St. Patrick really exist? Most of the miracles and stories he's linked to happened to other saints who came before him, like Palladius and Ninius, i.e. the werewolves of Ossery. As well, most of the stories attributed to Patrick, like the snake story, are complete nonsense. Did Down Patrick make it all up for tourist purposes, like Glastonbury did about Arthur? I don't think that Down Patrick made Patrick up. Uh, I think that Down Patrick embellished him a great deal. And there is this enormous and swelling body of uh, legend about him that starts quite early in the seventh century with Mirhu's life. But the real Patrick does seem attested by two letters that are preserved from him. In fact, they're the only certain letters from a British person in the 5th century, the 400s. And we can believe they're real because uh, they don't fit the confident, charismatic, miracle-working figure of uh, the legends. Uh, they're the work of a tired, beset, worried man in middle age or old age who's dealing with heavy criticism and also dealing with an amazing multitude of problems. And uh, they give us really a partial but really interesting picture of both Britain and Ireland in that period. So, yeah, he's a real man, but we can disregard pretty well everything in the lives of him written later as a uh, legend. The legends are interesting in their own right, but uh, the real guy is there in, in his own words. Well, what do you think of the two Patricks hypothesis? Uh, it seems to be losing popularity. Um, I remember Dr. Seb Falk was talking about how uh, hagiographies in general, people of the day were very happy to believe that these were allegorical, that they weren't literal, and it seems like literalism in these legends is really only a modern thing. I think that's entirely possible. I, I'm not quite sure how it can be proved. Mm. So next question is from fellow Bridget scholar, Lily, uh, and she says, what are Professor Hutton's views on goddess to saint translation in relation to Bridget as a saint and real person? It's a complete muddle. There seem to be two Bridgets, a saint and a goddess, and they're in different places and they're different personalities. And we aren't absolutely sure of either. The first lives of Bridget are from probably more than a hundred years after her death. Time for a great deal of legend to accumulate and maybe just possibly for a saint to have been invented. But she's located in a number of different places in the east of Ireland, above all at Kildare. Mm. She is associated with uh, plenty, uh, in other words, with milk and butter, and with horses. And uh, she's clearly a feisty, jolly kind of personality. And the other Bridget is not mentioned until later. The very earliest is around 900 
but could be considerably later than that. It's in Cormac's dictionary, which is supposed to be written by somebody at Cashel in Munster, the Southwest, mm -hmm. living around 900. But uh, we don't have any texts of it earlier than the 12th century, and most of them are late medieval. And it's clear that uh, items have constantly been added to the dictionary. So the references to Bridget could be considerably later than 900. And they portray her as a goddess, the daughter of the great god, the Dachter, and a specialist in healing, in smithcraft, and in poetry, none of which are associated with Bridget the Saint. So the two don't really collect, connect at all in personality or geography. So the most likely hunch is they're actually completely separate beings. And we can't be absolutely sure of the existence of either of them. She should be very happy with that answer. I know for sure. Uh, next spicy question. How accurate was Bede? He's said to be England's historian, but he puts miracles in his texts and has anti-Welsh bias. How much can we trust what he says in comparison to someone like Gildas or Gerald, my friend, Gerald of Wales? We can check Gerald of Wales really easily because he's writing much later and there are plenty of other authorities this time. Gildas stands alone. He's much earlier and he's not interested in history. And um, he's interested in complaining. And there's nothing around uh, of other evidence against which to check him. For Bede, we have a bit. We have the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which matches Bede's accounts. And I think in terms of actual events, he's really good on Northumbrian history after about 600, because that's within living memory of his own time, and he would have talked to some of the people involved in most of those events. Before that, he's unreliable, but he knows he's unreliable. He is dependent completely on others. He doesn't say very much about the process of conversion to Christianity. I'm not sure he knew very much about it. And what he does say is not entirely reliable, but in terms of the kings who reign after 600 and the things they did, uh, I, I think we can believe him. And there are also in his life of Cuthbert, some moments that actually look quite embarrassing to the Christian cause, <clears throat> like when uh, a group of uh, Christians from a monastery are being carried out to sea on a raft, and the local people who've come to hate Christians gather and jeer at them. Uh, this is clearly not a sign of a successful mission in a local Northumbrian community, and also the admission that when a plague arrives, a lot of people abandon Christianity which is not the kind of thing that Christians will want to hear. So there is stuff in B that is so counterintuitive to propaganda that I think we can believe it. So probably after 600, about 80% of B can be relied upon. Uh, before then, virtually nothing. What about Yostra? Because I remember in an email I sent you, somebody had asked me about hot cross buns and where this myth of... Saxons baking hot cross buns <laughs> for Easter came from. And I, I, I think I tracked it down to one home and garden magazine in the 1990s that has perpetuated this, this idea. But he mentions, I know Bede mentions Yostro once, I think. Yeah, he does. Uh, he mentions two goddesses, uh, Hreda, in connection with March, the Roman month, and Yostra in connection to April. Uh, and that's it. Mm -hmm. April is the Yoster month from the goddess. Uh, he doesn't connect Yoster to Easter, but there has to be a good reason why the German-speaking peoples are the only peoples in Western and Central Europe who don't derive their name for Easter from the Roman one. So it must come from somewhere. So it could come from a goddess, except that she is the goddess associated with April. And... Easter isn't always in April. So it could be that her name is cognate with various uh, old Germanic words associated with the dawn and opening. Mm -hmm. And April is 
the opening month when the landscape in northern Europe turns green and the light begins to predominate properly over the dark. And Yostra could have been a dawn goddess as a result, or a goddess of the East. And Easter may have no connection with Yostra. Uh, it may come from the idea of the opening of Christ's tomb and the dawn of uh, a new age of Christianity. So once again, we end up with a puzzle. I, I, I'm kind of happy with puzzles. They give people room to believe different things. I agree with you. I, th I think it's far more interesting to have, have the question than the answer. Uh, speaking of which, the Picts and Pictish myths, Scottish mythology shares much in common with Irish, but there are many nature myths, especially around lakes and whirlpools that remain pure in Scottish tradition. Do you think this is a vestige of Pictish myths or beliefs? The answer again is we don't know. Uh, we know the Picts were Brits. Uh, their language has been analysed better than before, and it is a version of Brytonic, so it's related to Welsh. Uh, they're not a separate people. They are simply the Northern British, speaking dialects of their own up there. So I think it's pretty well certain that quite a bit of native, quite ancient British mythology has come through. But it's overlaid with so many Irish, Gaelic-speaking, and uh, Lowlands, Germanic-speaking, Scots influences, that untangling them is rather like unscrambling eggs. It's just that when you have common heroes on either side of the Irish Sea, like Finn, mm -hmm. and common figures like uh, the Carlech or Carliach, uh, then the Irish influence is playing. So then how, how accurate is Pictish Chronicles? <laughs> uh, it's better than nothing. The great thing about the early Scottish Chronicles is that uh, you can match them against each other. And the result is about four different conjectural reconstructions of Scottish history before about 900. But at least there's enough overlap between them to make us pretty sure that certain kings with certain names were reigning around certain times, and that some of them did certain things. And that's about it. But it's better than nothing. I agree. Um, ah, so uh, next question is, you had said in a talk that there is no real evidence for genuine paganism in Britain after 1030. This, this phrase was plastered all over medievalist.net. It was, it, I had a good laugh. So uh, you had said that there's no real evidence for genuine pagan, paganism in Britain after 1030. What about books like the Carmina Gadalica? Could it not be like the Lacnunga in which gods were substituted for Christ? Could pagan rituals have survived in folk medicine or folk charms? Well, I think that uh, pagan names survived in charms, not just folk charms. But after all, the Lutnunga is not written by folk, it's written by monks, like most of uh, the medical texts we have, in fact, all the medical texts we have from Anglo-Saxon England. And there are undoubted traces of paganism in them, uh, but there aren't in medical texts after 1030 that the Lacnunga and the rest are all from the 9th, early, 9th, 10th, early 11th centuries. So that dies out. And also it's not uh, a mark of surviving paganism, it's a pagan survival, a distinction which I explain at probably tedious length in the first chapter of my most recent book, Queens of the Wild, that surviving paganism is where people worship pagan deities instead of Christian deities. Uh, or alongside Christian deities and have a pagan identity. Uh, pagan survivals, the way you have a Christian culture that is absolutely studded with uh, ideas, images, practices, traditions taken over from paganism, but under the Christian umbrella. So there's plenty of stuff that comes through from paganism, but it's not the same thing as surviving paganism. Uh, a self-conscious, self-contained religious system.
Now, we do have real paganism back in the 20th century. Speaking of which, how did Beira or Vara go from being a hag spirit in Ireland to being Bridget's sister and a goddess of winter in Scotland? I think I don't think they're the same character, but that, that's the question. We're not sure. Uh, all that we can say for certain is this, that there's no trace in medieval or early modern Irish or Scottish literature of an enormous nature spirit associated with uh, wild places and winter of the sort you find in 20th century folklorist books. What you have instead is a great tradition of hags, that is powerful, superhuman women who are often quite uh, deadly to heroes and have to be worsted by them or they kill them. And you have the Kalia Ver, uh, who's uh, a geriatric, depressed woman, mourning the days in which she was young and beautiful and powerful. And the message of the poem is that worldly wealth and beauty and power are worthless in the last analysis. It's, it's a deeply Christian message. The only hope is heaven. And from her name, Talia, uh, the veiled one, she probably was a nun or had become one, writing. And this is quite a famous poem, Medieval Ireland. And her name, Talia Ver, then gets attached to powerful nature spirits in modern folklore. But the modern folklore itself doesn't speak of the Talia. It speaks of Kalias in the plural. Different powerful, superhuman or supernatural hags attached to particular places in Ireland and Scotland. And then in the 20th century, uh, a couple of folklorists create this composite figure called the Taliach and decide she's an ancient pagan goddess. So there's actually no trace of the Taliach uh, known to modern pagans very widely, especially Druids, uh, before the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s. She's had a long period of development. Speaking of uh, things that have no evidence, um, Taliesin's name, was it a title taken up by bards in the Welsh court? Were there anything but his war poems written by the original Taliesin? And I say, if there was an original Taliesin. Who knows? <laughs> uh, there's... No trace of the idea that Taliesin has a title till the late 20th century when novelists started the movement to turn figures like Taliesin and Merlin into the Merlin and the Taliesin. Uh, in medieval literature, they are unequivocally pat a particular personality. Even if stories about the personality keep being produced century after century, in many ways not really connecting. In the early 20th century, scholars of Welsh literature decided that most of the poems credited to Taliesin in the High Middle Ages, the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries, dated from probably the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries. But there was a corpus of uh, older poems that possibly were by the original Taliesin in the 6th century. Even that's in doubt because one scholar, uh, uh, Professor Isaacs, uh, claimed to have found a linguistic formulation in the older Taliesin poems that wasn't around before the 12th century. So we can't be absolutely sure of that, although his view has been challenged. So all we can say for sure is that textually, we can be certain that a lot of the poems credited to Taliesin were composed round about uh, half a millennium or more after his reputed time. We may have absolutely nothing from the original Taliesin. There may have been no original Taliesin, but there's a lingering possibility that some of the war poems are from a real Taliesin living in the late 6th century. I'm sorry it's such a mess, but it's got more messy all through my lifetime. 
I think that that's how it is that when you're a historian, I'm I'm not a historian, I'm just an enthusiast. But the more the more you discover, the more you real, the more you know, the more you don't know. Uh, Ogam and Druids. How much of it did they use in their rituals? The Druid religion in general. How much of it survives from what it used to be? Was much of it okay? Mm -hmm. The answer uh, again is we don't know. <laughs> The real problem here is how well OM is. Mm. Um, the experts in OM are undecided. It appears round about the time of the conversion of the Irish to Christianity. Um, the dispute among experts, which is unresolved, is whether we can therefore conclude that OM is a Christian system of writing that was developed with the appearance of literacy with the very first Christian missionaries in the 5th century, or whether it's an older native tradition that's already there before the Christians arrive. Uh, and frankly, the evidence in my eyes can't settle it one way or the other at present. Uh, therefore, there is no certainty that it was a Druidic system but there is a lingering possibility that it might have been. And, uh, oh, I forgot the, the last part of this question. Is, is mistletoe at Christmas actually their fault? No. <laughs> it's the fault of servants in great London households in the late 18th century. Mistletoe is associated with Druids, at least in the south of France, by the Roman naturalist Pliny, who said that they go wild about it when they find it on an oak tree, and then they cut it on the sixth day off the next new moon. There's nothing about midwinter in any of that, uh, and nothing about mid mistletoe and other trees at other times of the year. Then in the late 18th century, mistletoe becomes a fad in wealthy, sophisticated London households, until now, holly and ivy are the great Christmas greenery. Mistletoe is much rarer, but it's getting more common in the 18th century. And it's sexy if you're used to boring old holly and ivy. And for some reason, the servants in some of these rich households in the English capital, the British capital, take to kissing underneath it. And when their employers find out very sportingly Instead of forbidding them, they imitate them. And so by the early 19th century, it's a well-known English custom and travels out across the English-speaking world. But uh, the Druids aren't interested in it at Christmas or growing on most of the trees from which it's cut. It's a missile oak that was the big deal to them. The Wilder Man by uh, Charles Fregard claims to catalogue surviving pagan customs throughout Europe, including the Mariloid, the Ren Boys of Fermanagh, the Burrymen, Trapajones in the north of Spain, and even Krampus. They call these things pagan rituals, but some of these customs are not that old. How can we tell what is religious folklore versus pagan ritual? I don't think that we can tell what's religious folklore versus pagan ritual if it's old in the early modern period. Uh, we can probably say that for sure that certain modes of folklore like lighting sacred bonfires at midsummer and at the beginning of uh, the summer pastures uh, venerating trees and poles that are dressed up in foliage to look like trees is all prehistoric because it's found over a great area and it's recorded quite early. Likewise, having summer kings and sometimes summer queens as well to preside over village festivals. This is really early. And at midwinter, giving presents, bringing in greenery to decorate homes and temples, later churches, uh, and lighting up the place. Uh, this is all recorded at the beginning of history. So there are an awful lot of folk customs that are genuinely pagan, even if uh, they were taken into Christian society and uh, lived quite comfortably within it most of the time. More generally, there are old modes of doing things like having dances to welcome in summer or having plays at midwinter to entertain communities stuck at home. 
that changed form. So there have always been plays at midwinter, but the Mummers play, the most famous Victorian English form, which scholars thought for a while was Neolithic, is actually an 18th century invention. Likewise, the Morris dance, the most famous of early summer English dances, is a 15th century courtly fad from France and Burgundy, which happened to put down popular roots in England in a way it didn't on the continent. So it depends what you're talking about. By saying the Morris dance and the Mamas play and lots of other 19th century customs are not older than at most the late Middle Ages, is not a way of saying that people didn't have pagan plays and dances. It's just the form of them changes every few hundred years as people get bored with the old lot. Um, now moving on to King Arthur, because we're running out of time. Arthur's name. Who was the first one to call him Arthur and which person inspired the original myths? We have no idea who inspired the original legend. Uh, we're absolutely sure who first mentions Arthur for with any certainty. Uh, and that is the unknown author of the Historia Britonum, the British history, who was writing in North Wales in the year 829, uh, the, the date is in the book, and who was constructing a history of his people, the Welsh. And this unveils Arthur as uh, a hero victorious over the invading English in uh, a dozen battles with specific names, most of which are not credited to any other hero or historic character. And that's as far back as we can go. There are a few possible earlier references, but they're, at, they're really deeply uncertain. So the Historia Britonum is where Arthur begins. And the essential Arthur is already there, a great hero fighting up and down the country and fighting foreign foes to defend his people. Speaking of uncertain heroes, Robin Hood, was he linked to the Jack in the Green or was he meant to represent pagans? Was he a forest spirit who got reappropriated? Similarly, what about the Wood Woes? Uh, the Wood Woes and Robin Hood are two quite different things. Uh, and the Wood Woes and the Jack in the Green aren't connected at all. Uh, Robin Hood gets less pagan and less uh, godlike the further back you go. He looks pretty pagan and godlike in the 16th century still because he's a major character in the games that bring in summer. And he wears green and uh, he's associated with the greenwood. But when you cross the barrier, you get back before 1500. He's a hero of the people celebrated in ballads that are grittily, earthly real. There's no magic in them. There's no enchantment. And he's a deeply pious Christian, especially devoted to the Virgin Mary. Uh, he's just a better Christian than the rich churchman whom he robs mercilessly. And one might say they're pretty evil rich, rich churchmen. So you're entitled to see Robin's point of view. So... He's a realistic character, not a mythological one. And there probably was a real Robin Hood, but uh, he came from way back. He's already a legend by the late 13th century, by the 1260s. The best fit is with a character recovered from the legal records of Yorkshire back in the 1930s, who was an outlaw in Barnsdale, which is now on the A1 road, the Great North Road. Uh, going up through Yorkshire, who was uh, outlawed in the 1220s and hung out in that area. And he was quite a charismatic guy. He had the nickname Hobhood, which means the enchanted or fairy hood. And probably he's our original Robin, but we can probably never be sure. In your upcoming book about goddesses of love and war, or sex and violence, I think, as you said once, do you talk about the, the Morrigan? Was she the one god split into three spirits or three gods meant to represent one thing? Why are the Morrigan and the Thachtha the only two Irish gods to have the the title? I can't answer the last one. 
because uh, there, there isn't the material to answer it. Morrigan will certainly be in my book. Uh, she's a chum of mine. Uh, I think she's the Irish Venus. She is certainly often accompanying other war goddesses like the Barb and uh, the Navan. But she's not quite like them. Barb is really a personified hooded crow. Uh, she represents uh, the, the, the beasts that feast on the dead after a battle, and so she encourages the battle. And uh, the Nevin inspires terror when she is around Moria's panic. Uh, the Morrigan stands out from them. She loves battle, but she's also physically beautiful. And she gives victory to chosen heroes through sex. Uh, she gets it for the doctor after some really first-rate lovemaking. And she offers it to Cahullan and gets rudely rebuffed. Uh, and uh, Cahullan then drives her off. So she has a combination of sex and war, which is actually quite a common female pattern. It's the same you find in Venus, in Freya, in Inanna, in Ishtar to a, a lesser extent in Aphrodite. Did all Celts have fairies? Some only seem to have gods and spirits, as well as there any correlation between their fairies and the Japanese yokai? I think that pretty well most peoples over the world have a belief in uh, local spirits. Uh, often in the form of human beings who appear out of the natural world or have an alternative kind of human-like society inside the earth or in an alternative dimension or on fabled islands. And uh, therefore, all of the Celtic-speaking peoples have had this kind of spirit or uh, human-like being in their mental space because practically everybody does. I remember... Oh, yeah. Well, you were you were talking about on one program, we talked about Rupert Sheldrake and his idea of possibly morphic resonance. And I know there's also um, an idea of a universal mythology, possibly, where we seem to all have these similar characters, these similar creatures in, in our minds. I'll back that. Uh, Michael Olding, a, a very good American academic, mm -hmm. edited a great book recently called Small Gods. Uh, looking at this phenomenon across the world. I'm in 45 minutes now, and I have to go very okay. soon, unfortunately. I, I, I promised 30 to 40, and I've gone five no, minutes. No, 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 you, you, you've, you've already done so much, so uh, I was I was actually going to give some closing thoughts, but if you have to go, we, we can cut it now. Lovely. <laughs> it's been lovely working with you, Michelle. Oh, I'm so I'm so glad that you that you gave us even four minutes. That's so so lovely of you. And when you when you do have your your sequel to to Queens of the Wild, please let us come back and so we can actually ask you questions about that book as well. Sure, uh, it's my publisher who chooses titles for my books. Oh, <laughs> so I have no idea what the goddess one is going to be called. Sexy except violence, except I presume that goddesses will come in there somewhere. But uh, she may choose to call them something else. Mm. But I, I'm going to write the book. You know, assuming that I don't get hit by a bus or something, it's going <laughs> to happen. Well, I know there's that one, and then you're doing the second one for Oliver Cromwell as well. Yeah, I'm uh, probably going to finish that by the end of this year. I'm adding an extra chapter, which has slowed things up a bit. What, what is the charm with Ollie that you have? Uh, with Oliver? Yeah. Uh, he, he's a big target. I, I tend to hunt big game. <laughs> and <laughs> he is the most popular politician in British memory with the B British Broadcasting Corporation had a poll for the greatest Britons in uh, the year 2000, the best of the last millennium. Oliver was voted in third behind Churchill and Shakespeare and ahead of any monarch. Uh, and this is largely because of Victorian myth of him. He was truly talented, an incredibly brilliant politician and soldier, but he was also devious, manipulative and ruthless. And also got blamed for things that his party did and that he didn't do, like banning Christmas. 
Yeah, that's true. But he got blamed for those much later in the uh, the modern period. There, there is this anti Oliver theme that still runs on through uh, British memory, but really the official Oliver is a Victorian hero. Mm. Uh, actually, in modern terms, his most uh, exact counterparts are not modern British liberals or constitutionalists, but the American religious right. Funnily enough, we'll let you go. I don't want to take up any more of your time. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, I promise not to monopolize your email too much with questions. <laughs> your greatest virtue and your greatest fault is that you have a public email. So I won't. Uh... It's true. Now, my greatest <laughs> fault, which is probably a virtue, is that I try and reply to everybody. Everybody who's polite, at least. I, I would say that's a virtue. We need you, Professor. Well, I look forward so much to your next uh, Gresham College lecture which I'm very excited for, which I think is about magic in the uh, in, uh, Euro in continental Europe. My next actual Gresham lecture is one that suits you even better. It's on goddesses of sex and war. <laughs> September. Magic, magic. I hope you see the comments on those videos because there are thousands of people who comment saying how much they love you and how, uh, how fortunate they are they actually get to see these lectures because otherwise we would never wow. see them. Alas, I can't read any of the comments because there are thousands of them and I'm coping with the hundreds of emails I get every day. 